screen. So we go to interactive jobs. Um, it's scrolling down. There we go. <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed the demonstration of what work is really like. Everything going wrong, stuff changing, stuff that in theory worked last year not working anymore. So interactive jobs. So um, we've talked about the cluster a lot. We've talked about this workload manager. We have another metaphor here. That's the HPC diner, where basically the scheduling system is like the host in a restaurant. So there'll be a queue of people coming in. Um, and the host will try to distribute people in an optimal fashion. So for example, distribute parties of two into the section that has tables for just two people, leave some bigger tables open for, um, for bigger parties, which may not even be arrived yet. Do things like take reservations. Um, if they know a big party is coming for a reservation, they'll try to clear up a section so that they're able to seat people there soon, um, like as soon as they arrive. So I think we don't need to go over this metaphor a lot more. So what next then? Um, so why yeah, basically? Yeah, basically, uh, the queue, job of the queue is to to make certain that whatever you require in the like, what kind of features you want, what kind of stuff you want, your jobs will get it. So okay. whenever you whenever you request uh, a, like a seating for two, you will get the seating for two. Basically, you will get what kind of resources you need. Yeah, we'll talk about uh, various resources a bit. Yeah. Uh, later on. So why interactive jobs? And one of the questions in the HackMD exactly got to this point. So the question said, is testing debugging handled differently? Or is it the same submitting jobs? For example, we'd like to test and run quickly some script. So that's exactly why we talk about this first. Um, it used to be we do a lot of talking about writing the scripts and submitting it, but just like this question implies, submitting something and waiting five minutes or 10 minutes for the result to come back before you debug it, that's just not a great experience. Um, so now we first explain with interactive. So the basic idea with interactive is you can run these few commands and then it will go through the queue, but instead of having to write a script for it, you can enter the stuff directly on the command line and then see the results that come out. Or you can either yeah. even submit a, um, you can submit one job that's interactive and then you might wait a few minutes and then the job runs and then you have the complete shell session on the interactive node. And then you can run lots of things without queuing. So the disadvantage. So should oh, should we just start? Yeah. yeah. Should we okay. run it and should everybody in the audience could also run it? If yes. They feel like it. So now we're type along. So you're on your cluster. Um, let's see. So yeah. there's this command on here, some Python command. It's an all. It's a one-liner. Uh, command, but it basically just prints hi. Um, yeah. If you copy copy it from here, uh, there's a dollar sign in the front. We'll need to remove that in the future so that it's easier to copy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so what we got was hi from the login node. So the login node responded at hi. It's me who's running this command. Yeah. So for what we're doing now, you can be in any directory. So we're not saving any files or whatever. Okay. So now let's say we want to run this on a node environment. So basically in someone else's kitchen. If we copy this S run in front, um, and now what's the difference here? 
So at the beginning, we see s run dash dash mem equals 100, dash dash time equals 0, 10, 0. So if you notice, this looks a lot like what we put in the batch script that I was demonstrating. So s run is the thing that says, let's talk to the queuing manager, and then the resources, and then the command we run. And this will just run directly. So let's see. So we see job something is queued, waiting for resources. It's been allocated resources, high from CSL 38. So basically, we were able to run this on the environment in some other node. Yeah, so so basically, instead of like cooking in our own kitchen, we suddenly cooked in in a, a random kitchen that we just we just wanted a kitchen that has has a, some burner that we can use. Mm -hmm. So this would be useful for testing things like, for example, in my uh, lamps example, I could have used the dash n option here in order to start requesting some multiple CPU cores and things like that. Or in that case, multiple tasks, but we'll mm. talk about uh, parallel in later. Mm. So how would this work in practice? So, so if you have a code that you think works on the login node or your own computer, you basically just add s run from the front and do the very minimum verification that it works somewhere else. Or if you're doing development and things like that, you can quickly just run this and see the output and not have to worry about all the scripts and stuff like that. Um. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So here, here is an example that if you want to see what's in the queue, you can, you can open a new terminal. So, uh, I'll quickly, like if, if it's complicated for you to open a new terminal, uh, I'll just run it for you. So, uh, if I connect a new terminal to Triton, just a second no. And with the slurm q or slurm q, uh, whichever way you want to pronounce it, you can get uh, get get to see what jobs do you have in the queue. Yeah. Uh, so if I instead of let's say if I instead of uh, submitting this job, I'll put a job with the sleep, so it just hangs around for let's say thirty seconds, mm -hmm. so I can see it actually. <laughs> Uh, if I submit it, and in another terminal I type slurm q, mm. I can see that it's actually there in the queue. Yeah. So it's there, running there on the background. Yeah. So the next thing is a interactive session. Um. Let's see. So with interactive, we can basically, um get a complete shell somewhere else. I guess we can wait for this to finish. Yeah, mm. uh, yeah, no, it's not okay. finished. And in here, we can see that the queue is again empty. Yeah. For me. Oh, uh, OK. Um, Should I just run it? Yeah. So what happens when we like this? This might uh, be different for different universities. You might have different flags here to get an interactive yeah. session. But let's see. Yeah, I just been in Alto. It's these flags. Yeah. So this would be a good thing to do. Like, let's say you need to open a bunch of data and do some visualization or processing, something like that. And you got an email saying, please don't run this on the login node you can use this to get this session on some mm. other node. And then you can, um, let's see, what node does it say you're on now? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, like, it, it might look like, okay, nothing happened. What was the point of this command? Like it looks, the terminal looks completely the same. But if if I look at uh, type host name, which tells me which machine I'm running these commands in, suddenly shows me not login node, but this PE8 node. Mm -hmm. And if I 
on the if I bring the other terminal back, which has which I used to view the queue, uh, if I now run the slurm queue, I can notice that there's this interactive mm -hmm. bash uh, running yeah. in this PE8 node. So actually, now I have this exact same kind of a terminal, but it's not running anymore in the login node. It's now running in a separate uh, machine. Yeah. Okay. Um, and finally, we have interactive shell with graphics. So let's say you need to run a graphical program. There is another um, command here, which is s interactive. Yeah. And really, so now I will yeah. type a logout in this uh, job that is running. So uh, mm, oh, exit, sorry, that's a good uh, exit, point. and you will yeah. see that the job uh, finishes. And now, if I type the host name, I'm back in login three. It's yeah, running host name is a good idea usually because then you know what what system you're actually running in. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. where am I where I think I am? If you look at the terminal, you might be like, okay, like it looks the same all the time. It, it mm -hmm. like, it's very hard to tell what is the, uh, where yeah. am I, <laughs> where, where am I situated? But r yeah. running the host name command will tell you like which machine will execute these commands yeah. um, at any time. Okay. Um, hmm. Yes. Interactive with graphics. So this is a thing. This is a bit more complicated behind the scenes than the other command that uh, was run. But it does it in such a way that you can run graphical programs this way. But maybe we don't need to dwell on that and let's try to go faster and we can get um yeah get to the exercises yeah typically like uh, because everything in in the clusters happens through these terminals it's usually not the best idea to run that many graphical term graphical programs in the cluster yeah. it's better to just like run the graphical programs in your machine and take get the data from the cluster in some way uh, that you can then visualize it that's usually, yeah. but uh, we'll talk about it today later on when we talk about remote connections. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what about monitoring your usage? So there was a question above from how do I know how much time and memory I need? And for that, um, mm, what you'll yeah. usually do is run it a few times and just see how much resources it takes. So you might run it on your own computer and check the memory or run one job and just request some huge amount of memory and see how much it actually uses. And then you reduce it to that amount or start small. And if it crashes, then you increase it. So basically, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, usually like a good example would be that like your computer, if you have a laptop or something, it might have like 16 gigabytes of memory. So if yeah. it works on your laptop with 16 gigabytes, it should work in the in the queue as well. Uh, if you yeah. run it on your own machine and it takes an hour to run, uh, then I would put like two hours in the cluster and see how long it runs. Mm -hmm. If it crashes, then increase the time. It's it's a trial and error process, but it's yeah. usually a good idea to start from the uh, like the larger end of the scale and then work your way towards the mm -hmm. smaller end instead of like putting yeah. too strict of a limit and then uh, the job failing because you have set us mm -hmm. too strict of a limit. Um, yeah. But but yeah. it's a, it's a usually a trial and error process. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, yeah, do you want to show an example of the monitoring? So you slurm yeah, history. So, so yeah, if I use the slurm history command, well, you can see a lot of history here. Uh, I will limit it a bit so I can say, let's say one hour uh, like this. And can you make will... your terminal wider? Uh, oh, yeah. like, because the line yeah. is wrapping here. Yeah, it will have to. It's okay if it scrolls off the screen some. Yeah. Even yeah, so wider. It's a, it's a bit, yeah, the 
I will like, have to increase the share a bit. Uh, you can't move it outside of the share? I mean, it's okay if we miss some of it, just... Oh, okay. Like... Yeah. Uh, still... Uh, yeah, still too. Hmm. There. So we see a yeah, chart... quite small now to see. There's all of the job IDs we got when jobs were submitted, what it was when it was submitted. Mm -hmm. We see how much memory it actually used. Like these run extract things, Simo was running, I see it used about five gigabytes of memory and took, mm -hmm. what, three minutes? Yeah, so? I, I canceled those so so they are, mm -hmm. they haven't, they didn't completely use the memory that they were allocated. No. Yeah. But uh, so. Okay. If I if I if I limit the output still a bit, so let's say the last fifteen minutes. Yeah. Uh, if I put like fifteen min here, so we see only the the ones we have run in this session. Uh, you will see here that. For example, here's the Python job that that we run. It's a, it wraps around now, so don't be uh, mm -hmm. too worried about that. So you see that the job name is the Python. There's the start time when it run, how much memory it requested, and then you see here what is the memory usage, uh, like yeah. what was the memory used by the, and how much time it used. Yeah, and we previously already saw the Slurm queue that you can use to see uh, are there any jobs in your queue currently and it will show what's their status and stuff like that yeah so i think we basically covered everything important on the page so um we haven't covered it in the exact same order but you should have the basic idea um should we split to a break for 10 minutes and then give 20 or 30 minutes for independent work on this. Yeah, so, so here in the exercises, I'll quickly show the exercises. Uh, we have this uh, repository that you can download, this Git repository that you can download uh, using this command over here. Uh, and then uh, that has some other exercises as well that we'll be using on the coming days. And the first exercise, there's this, well, there's this program that uh, tries to utilize memory and you will, you will try to run it in different contexts, like just, just running it on, on login now through S run and so forth. And um, yeah, it, it hopefully will demonstrate in action how to how to use these uh, slurm commands to submit a job yeah. it's a good idea to probably uh, you can also use if you want to open a new window you can use this slurm watch mm -hmm. q command to watch uh, what jobs are running there so you can leave this open uh, like if you open a new terminal and you leave this open in the background and then submit some jobs so if I now run here like a S run mem five hundred, yeah, time ten minutes. If I run like a sleep <clears throat> sleep here, you can follow how it goes through the queue over here. So once it's in the queue, the watch will watch the mm -hmm. queue. <laughs> And what happens there? So it's running there in the background. So that's that's that can also be helpful for you if you want one once you're doing the job. Yeah, and if you're stuck with the exercises, join the Zoom that registered participants have. We have helpers from the different universities there. Um, yeah, what else? Hmm. Yeah, so basically explore. Um, the main point is to get experience running SRUN and Slurm history and things like that. And 
uh, be ready for the next part where we write the scripts. Okay. Yes. Great. So talk to you. Okay, so I guess let's give 10 minutes for break and maybe 25 minutes for exercises. So we come back until um, break, let's see, where's hack MD? Break until 05, until 30 minutes past the hour. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. See you later then. Bye. Bye. Hello. Hi. So, um, how were the exercises? Let's see what's written here. I don't see many questions, which is either a good sign yeah. or a bad sign. Um, so I'll make a poll here, like a straw poll, uh, that if you have done and done the uh, exercise, uh, please uh, put your name. name over here uh not name but oh yeah yeah no. not name <laughs> put yeah uh put them put a yeah. list kind of a so someone requests kind of a... five extra minutes should we do the exercises yeah. as a demo for five minutes and get the recording for people in the future mm. yeah sure yeah Okay. Yeah, so, I think. Uh... So now, if you're, I guess, either pay attention to what we're doing or zone out and keep working by yourself, and you can watch it later. Um. So, Simo, I'm going to your screen. Yeah. There you are. So in the hackam the there was a good question uh, that was like, where are we supposed to run these these exercises, and and the answer was that uh, on the login node and uh, i'll return a bit bit backwards uh, to to yesterday's enrico's talk about uh, where are we <laughs> like uh, just to like uh, reiterate this this certain concepts so that we get familiar with but, like basically uh, if you go to if you rent like a rent a cottage in the countryside or something you you get there you might want to get comfortable before you start unpacking your stuff and grilling your food and stuff like that you you first have to like get comfortable with the surroundings so so in in the cluster now uh the, the, in this slide uh, from enrico's talk we see like the, the concept of a cluster so we have this kind of a we have some machines over here where we actually run the stuff then we have uh, the data storage and then we have the login node so the login node uh, is the place where we are supposed to uh, do this kind of like job submissions and and this kind of like uh, menial tasks like uh, storing like editing our scripts and stuff like that. So that's the that's the entry point to the cluster. Uh, so whenever you're submitting jobs and everything like that, it's best to do it on the login node because there are, you are basically yourself. You're not. Yeah, yeah, you are there. Uh, and you are you are in a, like a normal computer basically, but of course you shouldn't run complicated stuff there like uh, like hard stuff there. You should then tell from the login node that stuff should go to the queue and run on the uh, CPUs and and so forth. And to do that, we use the queue. So let's go through the examples here. Uh, let's let's. Yeah. start going through them so let's get first the we need the the git uh repository yeah. over here so we run this git clone so 
version control is very important to learn and Git is the most popular version control system. So we have a course on that and materials on the webpage if you want to learn more on that. Uh, it's a very good tool to learn. Mm -hmm. So what are we now doing? So we have this program, Memory Hog, uh, that uh, uses a lot of memory to do nothing. Uh, doesn't sound that useful as a program, but we can use it to demonstrate some features of the queue. So let's okay. play around with it. So we have a we call it with Python and then the name of the program and then uh, we tell it how much memory we want to use. So let's do that. So in the command line here, I uh, I use tab to, uh, to automatically fill once I've written a few characters, so I don't have to waste waste my keyboard uh, mm -hmm. efficiency. Uh, so now that we have this command line, we can call it with 50 megabytes. And what yeah. it did? Yeah. yeah, what did it do, Richard? So it was just requesting more and more memory progressively. And we see it got up to how much allocated. I wish that was more readable. Well, anyway, I guess it tried yeah. to request 50 megabytes. Yeah. So so it used some, around that ballpark of a number. So here we, because we are, again, we are now in our entry point to the cluster. We are in the login node. So whatever comments we run here, we run them in the login node itself. So in this case, we used 50 megabytes of the login node's memory. Uh, doesn't matter, like 50 megabytes in modern systems doesn't matter that much, but if everybody starts doing it, then of course it can cause some problems. So instead of doing that, we want to run it in the queue using the srun command. So this is like the interactive usage, but not an interactive shell. So let's do this srun mem500 m okay. python SCC examples. So we're telling Slurm to give it 500 megabytes of memory. And the program itself is requesting 50 megabytes. So I guess that should work. Yeah. So so okay. by, with this default values for all of these parameters that Slurm has. Uh, but usually it's a better idea to tell them, tell it yourself. So Slurm will then allocate you, make certain that you can fit to these, or you can get these resources. It will get you these resources. Uh, by default, you will get one CPU. At least in Alta, you get one hour of compute time, and the default is uh, 500 megabytes. So it's yes. pretty redundant here, but we know that what we are asking when we uh, give it the we when we want the 500 megabytes. Yeah. Okay. So now that we run, we notice that it doesn't run out like it doesn't run instantaneously. We had some delay because we had this uh, queuing. Yeah, it had to allocate, but that was pretty fast. So mm. just a few seconds. Okay. So anyway, so do we check yeah. and see how much memory it used? Yeah. Uh, is that with Slurm? Yes, yeah, but before that, let's try to increase the memory. Uh, mm. So let's put here, let's go like 4,000 megabytes. So now we're asking okay. for more memory than the memory that, uh, right. oh, now we're using more memory than the memory we are asking. Yeah. And let's see how it goes. Okay, uh -huh. so now we get out of memory. One uh, error. OM kill event. So OOM yeah. means out of memory. So basically, uh, Slurm said this person's using way too many resources, and it kindly killed the job for you, so you can update this. So now you're trying two Let's try it. instead. Yeah. Let's try a bit lower memory limit. But this is still more than you're requesting. Yeah. But it works. But for some reason, it worked. Do you know, Richard? Can can you describe so, this discrepancy? We asked only for 500, yeah. and we still got it to run with 2,000. Yeah, so the way Triton works is 
uh, we've configured it where you can go over the memory limit by a little bit. Like, is it a factor of two or three, something like that? And it I won't kill you. Yeah. Or four or five. Well, anyway, you can go uh, over the amount. It's factor four, but yeah. You can go over the amount. And if... So if the node itself is starting to run out of memory, as in if everyone on the node is requesting too much, whoever is going over their allocation by the most amount is the first one to get killed. So basically this gives you a little bit leeway and makes it so you don't have to request a huge amount of memory if you only need it for a short segment like the uh, initial loading or something like that. But it's risky because you could very easily get killed. And it would be really bad if you ran something for several days and then it died when it was trying to save the data because that's when it used more memory. Mm. But we yeah, usually it's a good idea still still to put like a ceiling for the job that, that fits into the requirements that it, it uses. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like Richard said, some jobs might have like this kind of a bump uh during let's say data loading or data writing or uh where they for a short while they require much more memory than the average average memory users so uh, for that kind of jobs uh, like if we would put a hard ceiling to 100 percent, a lot of jobs might fail and then you would have to like put the average higher which would then mean that less jobs would get through the queue so it gives a leeway to uh, you to be a bit more relaxed with the memory okay uh, should we go on with the examples? So yeah, if we look so at let's look at the history. Slurm history. Yeah, I'll put like ten minutes here. So, so and of course the output is a bit messy. I will make it a bit bit smaller so that it fits. Hopefully, you're not watching this with your phone. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, I see a column that says max RSS. And I guess RSS stands for, what's it, resident set size? Resident set size, yeah. But anyway, you just so need it's to the, know... It's the memory that is actually loaded. Usually these codes load much more memory, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's not calculated for your <laughs> memory limit. Yeah. But so, yeah, so, so you can see here that the mem memory requirement, even though we use two gigabytes of memory, the memory uh, usage is not necessarily recorded because Slurm does like sampling uh, measurement of the memory usage and it does this sampling every 16 seconds or so. So uh, you don't get like a real, like the actual usage because that would reduce the efficiency of your job. You will get like some sort of a sample. So if we put like the sleep here, uh, let's say 60 seconds, yeah. uh, the sleep parameter to keep it alive, let's lower it to, let's say, 500 megabytes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Or 300 megabytes. And let's run it. Now it's sleeping for 60 seconds. So the slurm will capture it uh, in the. In the... Uh, okay. But you can use it like like the max RSS still is it's a good measurement to use uh, if you have because all of your jobs will be running more than sixty seconds mm -hmm. uh, if they're not then uh, yeah it's not necessarily a good idea so yeah uh let's see so we're waiting should we do the next example so we're halfway yeah. to the next hour or okay from our break so. How should yeah, we let's... schedule things? Yeah. Let's look at the HackMD. Are the uh, most of the people managed to do the exercise too? Uh, but then the last exercises on. Yeah. But people. But the last. Yeah, ones in, were... in the exercise two, we already have some spoilers coming from tomorrow about how to register multiple com multiple processors. So maybe we can do it after we discuss those in detail tomorrow so that yeah. we don't uh yeah yeah so the first three yeah. are the most important ones so yes seems good so yeah now 
the job run on the background while we were talking. And now if we look at the Slurm history, you can see that the actual memory is recorded. Okay. So you yeah. can see that the uh, the memory usage is correct. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so then there's, uh, yeah, these are maybe actually, well, this Slurm has its own commands that you can use to check what uh, lots of information in the cluster and what kind of nodes we have. Uh, be best command, the best commands are also, or many of these commands are also with the Slurm command itself. You can use Slurm help to see various commands mm -hmm. uh, that you can use to check, let's say, what uh, what is the status of the cluster and how many nodes are in use and stuff like that. Uh, like these commands are pretty much the same, uh, but yeah. be mi mindful that they exist. Mm -hmm. So what should we do now? Should we do another example? If we do another example, um, then it's basically to break time. Um, yeah, maybe we should mention this one. So let's mm -hmm. say we we would want to run multiple things. Like you, if you think about you're running something on your computer, you might do something that you have a script that runs a lot of stuff. And uh, if you uh, run on Triton, you might think that, OK, uh, yeah, if you run the S run command in a, in a loop or something, you put multiple S runs commands in the background, that's a good way to run stuff on, on the cluster. But actually, that's not a good way to do things. We will, we will be transitioning to Syria, all these uh, uh, script jobs or batch jobs uh, in a second. But why this isn't good is because if you think about, again, this structure that we have, you are running the commands in the login node. So when if you have like a for loop that runs many of these SRAN commands, they are still running from the login node. Like the actual SRAN command uh, is running. So so basically, if I if I would run here the SRAN sleep mm -hmm. sixty, mm -hmm. and if I now close this window, the job is killed. The job dies. Uh, the job is gone. And yeah. and it doesn't do what what you needed it to do, so we will be talking about these non-interactive jobs next. So if you would have like this kind of a loop uh, running in the login node, it would yeah. mean that this login node is like a single point of failure, and if that yeah. goes away, then your jobs goes away. Yeah. So you don't want to do that. You don't want to. You want to use S run and S interactive when you do actual interactive stuff where you actually are uh, watching what you're doing. Uh, if you're not doing it interactively, it's much better to use the queue non-interactively because then uh, you don't have to be there watching for it. Yeah. Um, yeah, OK. Should we, should we go to a break now and be back? at the top of the hour and then we're going right yeah. on time i think yeah if you have any any questions uh in the chat in the hackmd please ask them then we can uh, uh about the exercise or anything uh, please ask in the chat and we'll respond there okay cool so let's see hackmd uh let's make a note of the break Um, okay, see you in a little bit, 10 minutes, bye.